Do you think it's rude to give toilet seats as a gift? Toilet seats? Yeah. Depends on how close you are to someone. So if you're close to him, it's okay to give a toilet seat? Yeah. I mean, it'd be a bummer of a gift, but... <laughs> <laughs> that was a long reach for that, brother. That was a long reach for that. So. <laughs> Podcast. How are you today? Nothing could go wrong if you start a podcast talking about toilet seats as gifts. So I might as well tell you because it's not a surprise now because it's you know it's we're a couple months away from uh, the holiday season. But this year for Christmas, I gave away those Japanese squirting toilet seats. That was my gift, <clears throat> which I thought was a great gift. Between I don't know. I mean I don't know how deep you want to go into this. But it's like a bidet. It shoots water from a lot of different directions, and it provides uh, uh, a moment of freshness. Is that a good way to say? That's a good way to say that. I thought it was a great gift. I thought it'd be funny. It's practical. It's 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 um, it's it shows. I mean, how can it shows you care? It did not have the impact I thought it would. In fact, I bet you nobody I gave it to has even changed their toilet seat out yet. And I don't know. I mean, it's, I try not to get, it's bad to give gifts with expectations. I mean, that's dumb because you're just going to get your little feelers hurt. But I actually thought that was a pretty clever gift, even though um, it clearly wasn't. But that was, uh, that was part of the strategy this year. And, you know, and I, and I, I gave a lot of them. Not, a, I mean, not a million, not a hundred, not even, not even 10. But I, gave, I bet I gave away six. That's kind of a lot. I mean, that's more than one. And I don't know, and I'm not saying they didn't thank me. It's not about that. I mean, people were gracious and, and thoughtful. I just thought it would have a little boom to it. You know, it's funny. Hey, well, that's hilarious. And it would be practical. Hey, wow, this is really a great idea. Neither. Disappointment after disappointment. But, you know, if you work in safety and reliability, you're used to that. And it's, it's not even a big surprise to us. I mean, that's kind of how we live our lives. So, therefore... That's what I did, and that's how I went. So how are things going? So lots of excitement. I mean, there's bunches of stuff going on. You know, of course, it's it's almost around the corner, but we're doing the workshop in Vegas, the Costa Concordia, the, the cruise ship that rolled over on its side. That's scheduled for March 7th and 8th in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, I think there's still room to that. I haven't checked, but I think there is. And it's a two-dayer. And one day is with Nip and Arnold, and he's kind of gone around the world. He's definitely got it's 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 totally worth it. I mean, he's got all the interviews of the skipper, the master of that vessel, and that's completely worthwhile. And then we're going to spend a day talking about really the foundations of investigating with the new view in mind, um, which is a great time to spend. I mean, that's a that's a wonderful, perfect way to spend time. Uh, well, I don't know if it's perfect, but it'll be really fun. That's going on. Gosh, there's all sorts of stuff happening. I mean, we're popping. Uh, you know, can't you can't be busy enough. That's what I think. Um, but the year of living more gently and more generously and more gratefully is plugging right along. So then enough of that. Um, how about you? What's been up? I mean, it's uh it's we've not talked in a while, and I wonder if you're good and everything is great and all is well with the world. Because if it's not Today is going to change everything. You're going to have a great little discussion today with uh, the famous, world famous Shane Bush. So if you don't know Shane, um, he's been on the pod at least once before, I think twice before. Last time I got in trouble because um, uh, I guess we said things that were morally questionable, which if you know Shane, uh, that's funny because uh, he's not morally questionable at all. But this time I don't think we'll get in trouble for it, but Shane's, just a pleasant human being who's been doing this work a really, really, really long time. And we worked together for years. I mean, years. Well, I guess we still do because we still do workshops together five, six times a year. Um, and and Shane's just one of my favorite people just because he is one of my favorite people. And it's been fun because I don't know if Shane would say the same thing. Maybe you should ask him. I think it's a, we've kind of grown up together. We've definitely grown um, old together in kind of a professional way 
because we're pretty much the same age and we pretty much did the same job. We just did them at different places and we were pushed together a lot uh, 25 years ago and would go around the country and teach class. And uh, it was fun. I mean, we had a great time. It's the class was so different then than it is now, but we went out and really spread the news on new safety and human performance. And uh, gosh, we, I don't even know how many people were in those classes, but it was really fun. And I've just kept up with Shane and, and we get the opportunity to kind of hang out and talk and we took it. And anytime we can, I, I try to record it because I always think he has interesting stuff to talk about. And he does this time because I have not seen, seen Shane this excited over anything in a while. Um, he has developed a, a resilience model that they're using at the Idaho National Laboratory in kind of a pilot way to actually not manage the presence of risk, but to manage and measure the presence of resilience. And it's a, it's a game change. I mean, it's really, it is a very different way to look at, assess, and measure safety. It is also a very different way to talk about safety in an organization. And he has had just really, really, really good luck, not only using the tool, but diffusing the tool out with his, with his, his organization. And, and I, it, it's really resonating with the people who uh, he works with. And he, he, he was so excited to share it that that kind of gave us a reason to sit down and talk. And uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. I almost can guarantee Shane and I will talk again on the pod because I, I think he'll even have more data as they mature their pilot. So they're micro experimenting this out in the world. Um, not only to see how effective it is as a tool, but to see if it changes the, the fluency, the way people talk about and manage high-risk work and, and medium-risk work and, and, and routine work. And they're looking almost entirely at a system's ability to fail. So it's a very resilience engineering model, but he's carrying it into industrial safety. So it's coming out of the, the, the kind of the normal old operational safety side of the house. And that is worth talking about. And that's exactly what, I mean, that's, I was dying to talk to him about. So that's what we talked about. So that is the podcast is Shane and I talking about his resilience model. You, you'll hear, we're going to talk a little bit more about the toilet seat. And then we'll, I promise you that won't last long. So you'll make it through. And then we're going to get into a discussion around resilience. So sit back and relax unless you're driving and then sit up and pay attention. Um, those are the rules. And listen carefully to Shane Bush and Todd Conklin as we talk about Shane's new journey into a whole new way to think, which is exciting. It's fun to be with people when they're having new ideas. I love the sound that new ideas make. You'll hear it. Oh, no, that's how you know how much spice is too much. The second order effect. It's always the best. So tell me about this resilience what are you calling it? Resilience model? No, man. We're calling it the resilience scaling. It's going to be huge. So scale. So you, scale. So, so we're, scale is zero to five. So we're, we're giving it some kind hey, of linear way, predictability. Yeah. Yes, we are. And and I tried it out today on Kenny the Alligator Wrestler, and it worked really, really well. What would you learn? So let's talk about that. Okay. I, 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 would like it, I would like it if you took this over. That would be great for me. No, because I'm serious. You, show, you show Kenny, I show Kenny. A lot of people know about Kenny. Kenny's famous. And if Kenny, if they don't know about Kenny, then Kenny sticks his head in an alligator's mouth and forgets to wipe the sweat off of his forehead. Hence, the sweat drops in the alligator's mouth and it bites him. Off the right side of his head. Off, yeah, he wipes one side but not the other. Right. So on the resiliency scale, what we're doing is taking what you have started as a big movement in the failing safely or building a capacity for resilience, or in other words, inserting defenses or controls, right. and we're actually scaling it, and we're scaling it everything from developing procedures to uh, people out in the uh, field looking at the job. From a, So let's just start at the beginning. Let's do. Kenny the Alligator Wrestler. The resiliency scaling is zero means that you are totally 100% dependent upon a human being at a critical step, by the way. So this right. is a, this is, that's the, the qualifier. Right, gotcha. So if the step could result in injury, mission interruption, or damage, then that's when we would 
address the resiliency of that step, not the job, but that step. That critical step. That gotcha. Critical step. That makes sense. So let's say that Kenny's critical step was forgetting to wipe the sweat off of his brow, as an example. So we would have given him a resiliency of zero because it was 100% dependable on him remembering. And if you remember in your talks, you say, let's give it a probability of one, right? Yeah, 100%. Right. 100%. It might be a month. It might be a year. But the probability is 100. So we would say your resiliency is zero. Now, let's say that we assign somebody to peer check him, somebody to... Now, it helps, but it still wouldn't move it up much because maybe a one, possibly a tool, because you're using the tools and you're reducing the reliance on a single human being. And then if you want to insert in the process a checkoff that says you will do a peer check and you'll sign it off and it's formal and there's people watching for it and people looking for it, it might be a three. Now let's go to a five. A five means you put a helmet on him or actually you don't have him do it. The biggest misconception on the resiliency scale is people think that we're, we're wanting and our goal is to get everything to a five. There's no way. Some jobs require humans to do it, and you'll never get to five. And so when I introduce it to management, I have to quickly clarify that the level of resilience you're shooting for is the level of resilience you're willing to accept. And, that, and that's perfect. And not everything has to be resilient. Nope. Nope. Um, I mean, that's. I like how you say that. What do you What do you think about this? Is it working? Is it? It's, so I it's a really interesting way to think about I, it. I honestly think this has high, high potential. Now I'm still in the testing mode, and you and I, we're going to work it and rework it and rework it. But let's say, for example, because I've already had people in, today in class, they said, "Well, what's what? What about?" Hierarchy of needs. Isn't that the same thing? And the answer is absolutely H not. Hierarchy of controls, you mean? I'm sorry. Hierarchy of controls. And, and I should interrupt you long enough to tell you that the companies that I'm watching most closely yeah. have given up the hierarchy of controls. Uh, they just uh, talk agree. about every control is a control. It is. And so it's a fallacy to think that someone's going to remember a PPE any different than an administrative control, any different than... Now, engineered, you, you could argue, if it's truly engineered, but... It's apples and oranges. We're talking about human. We're talking about the dependency on a human, not the system as far as hierarchy of control. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. And so, and by the way, it's 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 the organization's dependence on a human. So let's go go back to Kenny for a minute. Ooh, that say, was really a smart thing you just said. Yeah, not the individual. No, dependence. that was really smart. It was the organization's dependence. Here's why we reworded it. We used to say that it was the human depending on the human or the human, but they don't have that control. No. The people that determine whether or not you're going to use a human or whether you're going to use uh, a tool or whether you're going to use a procedure check, whatever it is, is the organization, whoever the organization is. But, yeah, one of the first things that we get asked as soon as we talk about this is, uh, the example people love to throw in my face is yeah, break it off in you. Yeah, they what say, if a, okay, what if a guy, what if a drunk guy brings a baby to work? Yeah, it's yeah, like okay, that, come that on. Are... But one, the one that's really famous is because we talk about unwanted outcomes being injury, mission interruption, damage, and many of you have heard me talk about that. Is they'll say, well, what about someone tripping? What if somebody trips on the sidewalk and is going to get hurt? Your resiliency is zero. So what are you going to do about that? Well, then I ask them, is that acceptable risk for the company? for people to trip on the sidewalk? And the answer is yes, that's acceptable. Now, can we do things to reduce the probability like icing the sidewalks or teach them how to walk correctly and wear their proper foot here? Yeah, but we're not gonna go to a five. We'll never get to a five or not even a four, or not even a three. Yeah, why would you want to kind of? Because exactly. it's pretty it's not rare. Worth the cost. So I'm really excited about. How do you couple the, how do you know what a critical step is? Well, that's, and don't go too far into the no, Tony Mashar definition of, I mean. We keep it really, really simple. And I know that some people don't agree with this, but honestly, three criteria. And if it meets it, great. If it doesn't. But the three criteria is, first of all, it's a step that if done incorrectly could result in one of our unwanted outcomes. Injury, mission, interruption, or damage. Right. right. Gotcha. Something you have control of before you do it, whether you push it, pull it, shove it. And then thirdly, uh, once you've done it, you've done it. it, it it's, you, you've, the injury's occurred. The mission interruption has occurred, the reputation or whatever. 
and then or, and or the damage. So it's non-recoverable. It's non-recoverable. And, and again, I've had some people say, well, and they start arguing about critical steps. Well, it doesn't mean that. Don't do that. Right. If it's important, call it an important step or call it uh, whatever verbiage works for you to draw your attention to. I probably don't want this to happen. Whatever this is, use the resiliency scale. I love that's, it. That's all we're saying. Now, how are you? How are you doing your micro experimentation? Okay, so how are you trying it? What we're doing? What have you tried it on? Maybe that's a better question. And actually, to ask. this is the first week we're doing it, and we are. If people don't know it, we're in Bangkok and we're doing a Chevron class. And so, for those of you that have been through my three-day class, you know we do case studies. I call it Tab Five. It's where you fill out what were the, what was the story, what happened, what were the air precursors, lane conditions, all the traditional stuff. Right. What performance mode, and. Then what we do is we talk about what were the critical steps that led up to this unwanted outcome. And I have them rate them before we do the case study. So they have to, in other words, before we give corrective actions. What, what, what was it at a zero, one, two, three, four? And we got it all written out. So we actually define the different levels. And what is so cool about it is they'll give it a rating beforehand. And then when we get to the point of corrective actions, I'll challenge them either individually or as a team. Okay, your requirement is to move it up one scale. One scale. Ten minutes go. And it is amazing what people come up with for all the different uh, exercises or case studies we use on how quickly and how easily and how, um, as far as expenses, how, how, how low of an expense it is to do something simply as putting an a operator aid in place or putting a... Uh, something as simple as a peer check or something that doesn't cost you a whole lot of money, but the effect is tremendous on in increasing the resiliency. And it's quite it. a bit different than hazard identification because that's really on the wrong side of the equation. That's telling you what will hurt you. Yes. What you're, what you're managing are really things you can manage, which are safeguards. You're managing controls. In fact, he, he, when I introduced this to my management team at the Idaho National Lab, I, I, I was really – I knew I was onto something when – one of our senior managers, um, basically, as soon as he saw it, he said, and he's been around a long time, he said, you know, I have been handed a lot of documents that people have tried to convince me are leading indicators. And he says, for the first time, I think we finally got something here. Because now remember, from the time a job is decided, we're going to go out and replace this pump. You've got someone that's going to plan that. The planner is supposed to actually look for critical steps and right. be trained on that and right. then stamp them. I believe this is a two based on what we're doing today. And then, then then, when they give it to the scheduler or the engineer, the engineer is supposed to look at it and say, well, can I increase that real easy within cost and budget? And if they can move it to a two or a three, then they do it and they stamp it two or three. When they get to the field, the foreman or the manager and the workers in discussion have to acknowledge, hey, folks, we've got a critical step with a two here. And here's the outcome. Is there anything we can do to make it a three? And if not, then we accept the two, but be super careful. But if we can increase it to a three by, by using the reference material that we give them, great. So you're actually tracking this from cradle to grave. And then after the job's done, we actually critique it. Do we still believe we could have only got it to a two? Was there anything we could have done? And then if we think we can get it to a four, we feed that back through the system, so whenever they do this job again, the lessons learned is we, we should have been thinking about this as a three or four rather than a one or two because of whatever they came up with. But it's it's completely opposite of the way we've traditionally told people to manage risk. Oh, absolutely the opposite. That part is really sexy to me. That's yeah. very interesting to me at every level. Will people – well, it sounds like they like it. Will they use it? Will they do it? We already are. In fact, I have to tell you, the, uh, the guys that work with me at the Idaho National, Nail, uh, Idaho National Lab, and I have to give a, a shout-out here to Tyson Allen and, and Epperson and, and David, who have been working really hard with me. Um, the whole idea, and, and I love the way Tyson Allen puts it. He puts it this way. When you talk about we're going to run probability to 100, right. what his saying is we're turning our back on resiliency. Because, I'm sorry, let me reverse that. If we don't run the probability to one or to 100, however you do the math, right. we are turning our back on resiliency by saying, okay, we're going to make this a one, which means it's going to happen. Now we enter the resiliency scaling. 
But if you think about it, and our procedures actually say this, that if either the probability is low or the risk is low, either one, then it says right in our procedures, rely on the skill of the craft. So basically what it's saying is, take a chance. Yeah, turn your back. Turn your back. Throw the, throw throw, the dice. Throw the dice. And, and it might not be a year. Gamble. It might not be a – but eventually it's going to happen. And we're saying don't throw the dice no more. Well, I've studied companies that don't kill people because I'm really fixated on companies that don't kill people. Right. And they all say the same thing. The reason we don't kill people is because what we manage – our controls. So every company that doesn't kill people has said, we assume everything will happen every time. Yep. yep. Everything will yep. explode or blow up or yep. go crazy. Yeah. And what we make sure, what we ensure is in place are the controls. It's, it's, and this is a way, it, it's a way to sort of build, um, it's not really a process, it's a way to build a structure around scaling for resilience. I mean, they're artificial numbers. They're made up, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have the ability to increase resilience if you believe it's low. In fact, I'm glad you if said it low, the way you did because I don't care how you look at the resiliency scaling, whether it's 0 to 5 or 0 to 100. The bottom line is it's causing a discussion, and it's causing us to look at it and say, okay, we're rating it at and I would X. add, I would add the discussions on the right side of the conversation. Exactly. So it's causing the organization to talk about what controls are in place, what barriers are in place, okay. what safeguards are in place, what resilience is in place. Now, here's what's really interesting about it: we have customers, and for those of people in the Department of Energy world, our customers typically DOE. So we actually have managers now that have approached me and said, Shane, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. I'm working with a 40-year-old facility, I'm working with 40-year-old instrumentation, and I've looked at your resiliency scaling, and the highest I'm going to get is two. Best case scenario is two, yeah. Yeah, best case. I said, so you're telling me I've got to go to my customer and say, I can only get this to a two out of five. And I said, that's exactly what I'm saying yeah. to you. And because you need to, you, Exactly. Because the customer needs to now acknowledge what? I'm only giving you enough resources and time for a two. Now, if it truly is something where we can't afford a two for whatever reason, now that starts a whole new conversation, whether it's new instrumentation. So it's just got so many positive things to it as far as what it can do in causing conversations. But And people like it. So far, we've had very little uh, negative feedback. What's it look like? Have, have you written a document around yes, it? Yes, have. you got a book? Or what do you got? Uh, yeah, the book's going to be put out by Conklin and Bush, by That's the right. way. The and Todd it's due Conklin out 2021. Todd Conklin and his friend Shane Bush. Yep. How many books do you have finished now, Shane? Uh, is this your I, third? I, this is my third that's almost finished. In fact, I'm going to go on a book signing in the spring of 2021, so I want you to look forward to that. Okay, I'm, okay. No, I'm looking forward to it. I'm just thinking of how I can say this to you. Tu tienen cambio esta conversación en español. Do you want to change this conversation to Spanish? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yo soy muy guapo, no? Uh, no. Si, sí, no. No. So what we're going to do is, for those of you that want to see it, and as with everything that Todd and I do, we give it away. We give it away. Yeah, why not? And Especially this. Absolutely this. So within a week or two, it's going to be on my homepage. Within a week or two, it's going to be on bushgohpi.com, and it'll be on Todd Conklin's homepage. Hop 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 Hub. 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 And I want you it. to take this and tear it apart and look at it and see if it works and see if it doesn't work and provide as much feedback to me as you can so we can share it with the world. In fact, Charles Major has asked that I talk about this at the HPRCT. Oh, it's a good topic for HPRCT. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the great thing about it is by the time you get to HPRCT, because that's just a couple months from now, right? HPRCT is coming HPRCT, up real quick. You should have enough maturity around it, and you should have sort of uh, uh, tried it, yes. you know, micro-experimented it, yes. prototyped it. In fact, as I'm sitting here in Bangkok, my guys back at the Idaho National Lab are using this right now, both proactive and reactive, either during assessments or investigations. And we are giving – we're rating every single thing we do, whether proactive or reactive, so we can get an idea on – the scaling average. Where are we at on our scaling average? I think it's a great idea. I'm so, proud of you. It's, it's going to be it sounds, great. It's, I've not heard you this excited in a I know. Long I time. haven't been. I mean, I've been that, teaching that's... HBI for 20 years, and my wife Peggy's sitting right here. And have I ever had something that's got me up in the morning as much as this? I mean, so how freaked out would you be if I told you it's been way over 20 years? Do, it's been over do 20 years. Do we want to have that conversation? Are or you not? serious? Yeah. Are you still thinking? 
I try. <laughs> it feels no, like honestly, the, the reason I'm so excited is because as soon as we get done with this conversation, we're going for massages. So the sooner we can get this conversation done, the quicker we can get down. I say we go for a little Thai food. <laughs> Thai food, then massages. That's right. And we're actually staring out the window right now in the middle of Bangkok. Sukhumvit. We're in Sukhumvit. Sukhumvit. Mm-hmm. This is Sukhumvit? Sukhumvit is the, is the area, the neighborhood. So we're in the crown room in Sukhumvit looking out the windows at a beautiful neighborhood, and we're going to go eat Thai food and have foot massage and talk about resiliency. I think that's our plan. Does it sound good? Yep. Thank you for talking to me. You're always fun. This is going to be cool, Todd. This I'm is excited. the new thing. I'm this mostly excited thing. that you're going to write a book about it. I that am. is exciting to me. Remember, spring of 2021. Okay. We yep. got it. We got it on the calendar. It's, it's going to be right after my goal of climbing Mount Everest. So it'll okay. be. It'll so it's climb Mount Everest, yeah. then write your book. Yeah. Okay. Right in that order. So. Okay. Sounds good, brother. Thank, Thank you. What do you think? I told you. Wasn't it fun? Isn't he great? It was a great conversation. I'm glad you could be a part of it, too. It's really fun. I didn't tell you. So that was in the the lounge at the hotel we were staying at in Bangkok. So we were up there doing a class, just a fundamentals class, a big four-day fundamentals. We do that a lot, actually. And um, we took some time and uh, recorded the podcast. Before we went out for dinner, which he was pretty excited about, because the foot massage thing, that's huge for him. Giant. It's giant. So that's where we were. I probably should have said that in the beginning. I forgot. It slipped my mind. There was my mind. Slipped away. Completely slipping away. So that's the podcast for today. You had fun. Listen carefully, will you? Tell your friends. Subscribe if you get a chance. Get, Get one more person to listen. Just try to get one more person to listen. That would be good, actually. And tell them, my friend, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, y'all, be safe.